We are absolutely delighted that we have a very distinguished scientist, Professor Yuri Gogotsi, as a distinguished speaker of this conference. Professor Gogotsi is a professor and Bach and Dodd Professor of Material Science and Engineering at Drexel University, Philadelphia, USA. He is also the founding director of the Drexel Nanomaterial Institute and a Thousand Talents Plan Distinguished Foreign Professor at Jilin University, China, and Associate Editor of ACS Nano. There, that's where we also overlap quite a bit. So Professor Gagotsi works on nanostructured carbons and two-dimensional carbides for energy-related and biomedical application, which will come out uh, so vividly when he gives his talk. He has co-authored two books, published more than 500 journal papers, and obtained more than 50 patents. It's a remarkable uh, achievement, and please felicitate. He has received numerous national and international awards for his research. He has been highly acclaimed by many uh, societies and recognized widely. He was recognized as a highly cited researcher by Web of Science in material science and in chemistry and elected and a elected fellow of AAAS, MRS, ECS, and NanoSmat and so on, and the World Academy of Science uh, Ceramics. He also serves on MRS Board of Directors. So it's absolutely wonderful that we have the world leading scientist in nanoscience with us and he will tell us how his research has gone from lab to the translation stage and uh, at this stage I will not stand between him and you but I just wanted to say that this uh, cheering was uh, so, uh, expected to be done by Professor Rao who could not be here due to his, uh, he had to leave and he apologized that he could not be here to introduce you because he was not keeping well and uh, I'm sure we look forward to a very exciting lecture. So, may, Professor Gogots. I'm a material scientist, material chemist. We discover new materials, we develop improved materials, we tune materials for specific applications. And if we have right material, we can make devices, we can develop new technologies. So materials always come first here. But first of all, let me just tell you a couple of words where I come from. I come from Philadelphia in the United States. For people who have not been to uh, the US, it's uh, like uh, two hours from Washington DC, two hours from New York City, right between Washington and New York. And this is actually the first building of our university, which is 125 year old. And A.J. Drexel, is the person who created the Wall Street, the person who created the modern financial system. He was a very rich banker, and he uh, funded Andrew Carnegie, Rockefeller. He started with uh, JP Morgan, uh, uh, the banking modern system, convincing people to take money out of their homes and pocket and invest into future technology. At that time, railroads, uh, oil development here. So something uh, which probably uh, clicks with uh, transfer of modern technology to real applications today here. But what I'm going to particular focus on are two-dimensional materials. For many years, my group has been exploring carbon nanomaterials, ceramic materials here. But in the past decade or a little bit more, particularly since uh, discovery of new, very interesting physical properties in graphene by Andrew Gaiman, Kostin, and Vasolov, attention of the materials research community has been largely attracted to graphene and other 2D materials. And in fact, graphene is just one of many, many 2D materials that uh, we uh, know. If you talk about industrial application, clays, they are in bumper of every car, nanocomposite materials, reinforced by clay, tonnage wise, are probably the most uh, widely used nanomaterials. Even so, people rarely think about clay as something nano. But exfoliated in particle, put, in, put into polymers here, it makes a very big difference in industry here. 
Dutch Lacogenites, molydisulfide, was actually exfoliated in single layer sheets even before graphene. Boronitride, many materials here. Most of them are actually semiconductors or dielectrics uh, here. Uh, but what is also interesting, first people started following graphene exfoliate other 2D materials which had layered structures. Clay, Dutch alkogenides, there are 54, I believe, of them possible uh, here. But over the past seven, eight years, it has been demonstrated that even materials that no one expected to exist in a two-dimensional state. For example, silicon. Uh, you uh, heard today the first lecture uh, tutorial was largely dedicated to silicon technology. Can be produced as 2D sheets as a silicin, germanine. Borophin uh, was produced just two years ago. Gallium arsenide, many, many others. They don't have layered precursors. So basically, the idea is Many materials we don't expect in 2D can be made in 2D in atomically thin sheets or a few atom thin sheets. What is more important, bringing totally different properties from their counterpart. And this is what is exciting about 2D materials here. In 2011, we showed that carbides and nitrides of two dimensional, uh, carbides and nitrides of transition metals, which again, don't form uh, weakly bonded Van der Waals crystals that also can be made in a two-dimensional stage. Those are materials, maxines, I'm largely going to talk about today here. But why 2D? What is exciting about this? One thing I mentioned briefly, properties. We can obtain new properties which are not feasible in three-dimensional stage. And we have a variety. We have metals, semiconductors. Uh, actually, Maxine, most of them are real metals. Uh, they have very high flexibility, surface flexibility. If we're talking about wearable internet, internet of things, we want printable devices. We want devices everywhere. You cannot do it by uh, using uh, multi-billion dollar uh, foundries that I used today to make silicon chips here. We need printable, we need flexible stuff here. And what is also very important, having already now a couple of hundred of 2D materials and with a couple of thousands being predicted to exist as simple stable structures, we have building block by combining which we can pretty much get any combination of properties possible. And they can be really like a pile up like bricks layer by layer, combining different layers. And this is what I believe will make a difference for the future technologies here. So I'm sure everyone here, not being even an expert in material science or nanotechnology, has heard about graphene. But maxines can be known for some people who already uh, during uh, the day I spent here today approach me uh, talking about this material. Some of you might have not heard about it here, but about a year and a half ago, uh, Mitch Jacobi, a science writer for uh, uh, Bulletin of the American Chemical Society, CNN, talked to a number of people in the two-dimensional field, uh, materials field, about what is next, what is coming, what is going basically come after graphene. And as you can see, Maxine's appeared on the cover of this special issue of the CNN, Maxine's open uh, this cover story article. So it's not just me, it's a scientific community believe that this is something that is really most exciting uh, among the very large family of two-dimensional material things here. So what are they? Those materials are very simple. There are just few atoms seen like every other 2D materials here. Uh, from actually uh, three layers to like a seven layers of atoms here. But there is also a very big difference compared to majority, greatest majority of other materials, 2D materials. They are true metals with a high density of state at the Fermi level, with a high concentration of carriers. Graphene being priced for high conductivity is in fact a zero band gap semiconductor. For example, a limited by quantum capacitance in energy storage applications with low concentration of carriers and when you start uh, 
creating holes, defects uh, to increase the number of carriers, you lose conductivity here. But moreover, the surface of these materials looks like surface of transition metal oxide or hydroxide. And oxidation of the surface, unlike in graphene, does not kill conductivity. Material still remains a metal. So the kind of a combined properties of real metals, the real two-dimensional metals, at the same time, chemically on the surface, they look like transition metal oxides. So they can be used, for example, to store energy in battery supercapacitor. They can change oxidation state. Many transition metals are good catalysts. They can be used in catalysis in other applications. Moreover, they come in three different uh, flavors. We call them 2, 1, 3, 2, 4, 3 structure. So these large gold uh, spheres are transition metals. Black uh, dots in between are carbons or nitrogen here. And uh, OH termination shown on the surface. And within a year after discovery by Michael Nagy, PhD student who worked with uh, Professor Michelle Barzum and myself at Drexel, we showed that we can make materials in all the three groups. Moreover, we can make carbon nitrides, for example, titanium 3CN, and we can make also solid solution on M side. So M is transition metal, X, carbon nitrogen, suffix in, just like graphene, germanine, borophene, stand to show two dimensionality of this material. So we are really having a very large family of materials. The first one was titanium 3C2 discovered here. We have more than 30 materials experimentally produced today after this first uh, publication here. We went computationally over millions of solid solution compositions. So it's really unlimited variety of composition and properties possible. We're just starting to uncover what is possible in that field. But moreover, what is important? The synthesis is fairly simple. We start with ceramics, known as max phases. My colleague at Drexel University, Professor Michel Barzum, is known as the father of this field. He started to explore it more than 20 years ago. Those like titanium aluminum carbide, titanium silicon carbide, other layered carbides here. What we do, we take this ceramic material that has monolayers of atoms like aluminum or silicon. We etch this layer of atoms away. And if you look at the high resolution stem images uh, on the right side, you will see that layers, dark layers of atoms disappeared now and there is now space between the layer. We got after etching weakly hydrogen bond, uh, bonded structure, which can be delaminated in single sheets here. So the process is very simple. We take a powder, we dump it into solution. Uh, we get it etched, uh, and we produce, and this is like a one liter bottle with about 400 milliliter colloidal solution, 1020 milligram per milliliter of single layer particles. You can see Tyndall effect, but if you dilute solution of different maxines, you will get different colors because they have different electronic properties. Some of them are actually semiconductors or uh, narrow band gap semiconductor or semi-metals here. But there you see they give plasma resonance at different uh, wavelengths. They're different here. But when you have colloidal solution, doesn't matter. You have graphene oxide, you have uh, boronitrides and senials. Important is that since they have hydrophilic oxide-like surfaces, we can work in water. We just take water, we get colloidal solution, we can spin coat it, spray coat it, uh, deep coat it, uh, vacuum filter, produce transparent conducting films, or produce film by filtration, thicker film, or we can take a slurry after etching, roll it through a uh, rolling mill, and produce a film, which is, you can see here from this middle image, like a foil, it's a metallically shiny, it's conducting electricity very well. If you make an electrode, you don't need a binder, you don't need conducting additive naturally here, and you actually don't need even a current collector because it conducts electricity so well. Currently, we get about 16,000 Siemens per centimeter. To the best of my knowledge, this is the most conducting solution processed material, nanomaterial reported here. Moreover, what is nice, as I mentioned already here, we have lots of these materials. They can be seen like M2X structures, M3C2, M4C3 uh, or M4N3, and we actually just added now another layer of structure. But what is interesting, they can form random solid solution. But three years ago, 
we showed that we can make ordered double transition metal maxine. So one layer surface, for example, moly, inner layer of titanium, another outer moly. So we push nanotechnology really to the limit when we align layers of atoms in the way we want here. It's actually thermodynamically driven, so those are metastable structures, uh, and it's really thermodynamics tell whether a random solid solution will be formed or a layer of structure like that here. But what is important, we access a variety of properties. As I mentioned, more than 30 have been produced. And a group in Sweden two years ago produced order a divacancy maxine considered to be like a one layer, like a monatomic, like a string of atoms. Every third one is missing on the surface. So basically, we can truly push design at the nanoscale to unbelievable level. We can manipulate atoms, and we can create building blocks that can be used here. But what is also very important, you read about discovery of many nanomaterials. Borophene was predicted by Boris Jakobson two years ago, synthesized by Japanese scientists about the same time, made a lot of headlines and still exists as a monolayer on a silver substrate, and its metallicity is still to be experimentally shown because you cannot separate it from metal to measure normally here. Gallium uh, nitride was produced as a monolayer under a layer of graphene at Penn State about two and a half years ago, again, made a lot of news, and they stay as a monolayer. We make in the lab, we have a reactor, this one is a one liter reactor, two liter reactor. We can make up to a 200 gram batch in the lab at Drexel University. If you make a transparent conducting coat, you actually can cover a football field with material we're already making in the laboratory, and we're working with a major international corporation that licensed several patents from Drexel University and got exclusive license for a few applications now. And unfortunately, I cannot name the company because they want to fly on the radar screen until they put products on the market, which are, and they are scaling it up to, uh, at the moment, 100 kilogram properties here. Moreover, it's not just one like a titanium 3C2, the first one, easiest one. Even these atomic sandwiches, and actually the first paper on this was on the cover of ACS Nana uh, in 2015, uh, published uh, uh, on uh, double transition metal maxine. You see, it's an undergraduate student who did synthesis of 40 gram of moly to titanium C2, and we can delaminate it all in single layer particles with a uh, few nanometers, or few micrometers to about 20 micrometers lateral size here. And this is very, very important. So it is an intrinsically scalable nanotechnology. Nanomaterials don't need to be produced in nanogram quantities or microgram quantities here. They can and should be produced in large quantities if we want to explore application like batteries, supercapacitors, catalysis, other when we need more materials than a monolayer on a wafer here. And of course, depending on how we do the synthesis, we can produce materials which are quite perfect crystal. You can see even like a hexagonal symmetry inherited from the precursor phase. And we can make materials with a lot of pinholes. And it doesn't necessarily is one is bad, another is good. If you want to have high surface area, if you want ions easily diffuse through the layers, we want to have defects in pinholes. If you want to have a very strong coating uh, with uh, tens of uh, gigapascal uh, tensile strengths, if you want to have extreme conductivity, we want to large and perfect particles. It's all about being able to control it here. And of course, if you have an ink, you can print it. You can do inkjet printing, uh, screen printing. Uh, this is a writing with Maxine, a ink filled pen, automatic pen. And this picture of Mildred Dresselhaus, uh, who is one of the most prominent nanoscientists, she passed away uh, in uh, spring 2017. So my student, uh, 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 printed uh, your uh, picture, and you can see a small uh, uh, laser, uh, small uh, basically diode uh, uh, light uh, being uh, on uh, because this image is conducting, because the ink is conducting. And again, it's water soluble. You just make a solution of the synthesis, and you can use it as ink uh, here. And of course, we can also produce larger sheets of the material, and if this uh, movie plays, and I'm not sure how to make it play, no, sorry. Uh, uh, can you uh, 
print, uh, click on the computer on it, uh, someone? Uh, okay, uh, you just, yeah, uh, just a click on the image. It should be playing the movie. It worked, no. Well, again, sorry, uh, doesn't matter. It worked in the morning. You would see the synthesis process. Uh, when we transfer it to PC in the morning, it worked, but probably it has been lost maybe uh, during transfer here. Anyway, what is important is that by simple spray coating this film, uh, we can make, for example, this Drexel logo that my student Kathleen Maleski is holding here, or like a letter-sized sheet, and this is actually a five micron thin paper, but you can make a paper airplane out of it, you can cut it into electrode films here, and depending on how flakes are ordered in the film, it will be from 1,000 to typically 10,000 if we do spin coating or vacuum annealing, you, we can currently get about 16,000 cement per centimeter, which is a very, very high conductivity. Compared, for example, for carbon electrode activated carbon we use in supercapacitor, we consider it to be conducting electrodes, it's like a three orders of magnitude higher than that here. And again, we produce it by buying for $20 a spray gun for spraying paint in a, a hardware store, Home Depot in the US, and do it here. So again, it's possible to do nanotechnology with simple means. And, here. and why these materials are good? I talked to you a lot that we can make them. There are many of them things here, but they do really have a variety of very interesting properties here. First of all, with, surface, with no surface termination, all of them would be metals, but surface termination can open the band gap. For example, oxygen termination uh, can open band gap in M2C maxine because they can pull electron density away from a thin structure, especially here. Many interesting properties have been predicted here. For example, uh, topological insulators, quantum spill uh, hull phases related to it here. Uh, ultra low or actually very high work function on some of the materials. Chemically tunable superconductivity. Dirac fermions so cones like in a band structure of uh, graphene and others as a function of composition. And what the community is doing, it's not only us. Research in Maxine is going on in more than 40 countries now. Actually, number of publications from China already about three times higher than uh, number of papers from the US uh, coming here. And we're exploring step-by-step -step properties here. For example, we showed that these flakes are very, very strong. You can see here titanium 3 c 2 monolayers and bilayers we tested compared to perfect graphene. The trick is here, you can see graphene and boronitride have two highest bars, but those were produced by peeling off perfect single crystals. If you take solution processes, graphene oxide, reducing graphene oxide, moly S2, titanium 3C2 is already stronger. We measure it in urban 4C3, results have not been published yet, it has about 50% highest strong strengths and modules here. So about 25 GPA tensile strengths, about 450 uh, gigapascal Young's modules on these materials here. So they can be used to make composites and also they fail in a gracious way and these are molecular dynamic simulations of these materials, but also showing that even for titanium carbide, depending on the composition, titanium 2C, titanium 3C2, titanium 4C3, you expect different properties here. What is important, since we have strong large flakes, we can, for example, make fibers. We can do, we can actually spin fibers, uh, we can uh, gel cast fibers, and this is a work done with Australian colleagues on bi-scrolling uh, fibers with actually loading about 98% uh, of maxine and 2% carbon nanotubes, and you can see we can make a knot on these fibers, and we can actually really make textile with these fibers. We are working with a colleague at Drexel when they do knitting of these fibers into textile, making smart textiles out of it here. You can use them as a conducting additive to other materials. For example, sintering with zinc oxide ceramics, it suppresses grain growth, and at the same time gives conductivity just uh, with 1% uh, of additive. And the result, for example, it's possible to increase both hardness Young's modulus of zinc oxide ceramics and power factor in application, <coughs> thermoelectric applications here. 
We can also make a variety of films and composite materials. And one of actually very first amazing application appeared to be electromagnetic shielding. Everything needs to be shielded. Actually, in my hotel room here, I found a plaque telling that there is a lot of electromagnetic pollution that can badly affect people, and this hotel is uh, uh, protecting us here. But what is more important, we need to protect everything. Our basically audiovisual equipment, cell phones, they all need components shielded here. And we need currently metal foils is used, or metal plates are used here. What is important here? With Maxine, we showed that it's possible with one to two micron film, those are stars uh, here at the edge of the plot here, to do the same job, it's a similar logarithmic plot. It's 70, 80 micron film of graphene or about two millimeter of composite material. This was the first publication I showed show mechanical properties, electromagnetic. This is the first, very far from the best. Currently, we showed that, to, we showed at that paper that to reach 50 uh, decibel electromagnetic shielding, it's sufficient to have about one to two micron film. We can do it now, actually we showed that we can have a four decibel per mono layer. So we have actually tens of nanometer film sufficient to provide shielding for equipment which currently uh, metal foil 10, 12 micron will do here. Moreover, if you take them into antennas, and this is again work was published actually in press, it was already published about a month ago, I should have updated the slide here. If you look at attenuation, basically losses, titanium 32, it lays below gold, it lays below every single material study. And again, this is the first attempt. By no means it's supposed to be the best material or the best antenna designed here. This is because of two-dimensionality and this is very high conductivity. We can make RFID tag, again, our first RFID tag, we're reaching like a eight meters, allowing, for example, potentially uh, like a stores when there are uh, no sales personnel needed here. Because when you walk out, every atom that can print that RFID tag can be read automatically and charged to your uh, credit card uh, from this here. So again, those are technologies potentially absolutely critical for Internet of Things wearable internet that we are trying to develop with these materials here. There are also very interesting optical properties. So again, approach we take and the community takes. We study properties, we understand properties, knowing the properties, we develop technology. If you see different materials, I already mentioned, will have different colors of solutions because they show plasma resonance in different wavelengths. These peaks that you can see, these are plasma resonance absorption peaks. Some of them in a visible range, some actually go to infrared range. We can do surface inherent Raman spectroscopy instead of gold nanoparticles, but one of the applications that has been widely explored now, there are already a couple of review papers on this, is using photothermal therapy because when we can shine light, which will be is near infrared, like a 780 nanometer, for example, for titanium 32, or infrared for some maxine, like titanium 4, C3, and others here, and destroy by heating sample just with a benign uh, irradiation tumors uh, heating deep in the body, much deeper than, for example, gold nanoparticles that gives plasma resonance in a visible range and can be used to uh, only like a skin deep uh, tumor destruction. But there are many other biomedical applications emerging. Brain electrodes, actually two papers published in ACS Nano uh, just like uh, this year. One showing that in brain electrode, it actually gives a better signal to noise ratio compared to gold electrode, again, currently uh, standard used here. And also, uh, just about a month ago, uh, it appeared uh, online uh, paper, uh, should be in the next issue of ACS Nano, showing that it's possible to adsorb urea molecules for building artificial kidney because of large surface area and, again, uh, high negative charge on maxines and uh, urea, small molecules that are very difficult to absorb, absorb, can be absorbed in very large quantities here. So, basically, as we move step by step, application are emerging. And the last one I'm going to talk about is actually what we're doing in my group a lot, energy storage. Uh, you will hear tomorrow plenary lecture on electrochemical energy storage applications, uh, as I understand here, but what is important? We all depend on batteries nowadays. All our cell phones, computers, PDS, 
storing uh, renewable energy here. But moreover, electric cars, for example, I'm showing a star, this Aragoni plot we call specific power with specific energy. For people who are not in the field, specific power shows you how well you can accelerate. For example, you have a car. Specific energy shows you how far you can go on a single charge. Currently, lithium-ion battery can take you a couple of uh, hundred uh, kilometers, but charging it takes a long time. You cannot come to a gas station, charge it quickly. Star I put in the place where Elon Musk promised that within five to 10 minutes, we should be able within a few years to charge a battery. How can you do it here? The key thing is here, you need to have materials which are highly electrically conducting because if you have oxides using batteries today, basically if you have a resistor and apply high current, you transform it into a heater. You cannot charge quickly because charging quickly means running very high current. Second, you cannot have bulk diffusion, like in a current battery materials, you need to eliminate biodiffusion. So what do you need? You need materials with a high surface area where everything happens on the surface. There are no diffusion limitations. Second, you need material with a much higher conductivity compared to material used today. And this is exactly where Maxine can open an opportunity. They can actually have properties of supercapacitor because they're high surface area two dimensional sheets, but they have transition metal on the surface that can change oxidation state, storing more energy by redox reactions here. Moreover, actually, we can push them actually in other application I'm not going to talk about today, even uh, toward electrolytic capacitor rate, because we can actually, because of their conductivity, go to the range we can do a CDC conversion, for example, of the current here. But we basically can combine batteries, those are right plots, and uh, supercapacitor behavior into one material. Because again, we have layers where electrons can run within layers and ions can move between layers. What I'm showing here, for example, this is structure of titanium 3 c 2 maxine with monolayer of water and water with uh, uh, potassium ions uh, uh, or sodium ions in between uh, here. But it's important here that it can be small ions like proton and lithium, but even large magnesium 2 plus aluminum 3 plus can still uh, be uh, spontaneously or by applying charge intercalated here. So what we do, we started to build devices looking into the mechanism. What can be done with this here? Uh, this work was published last summer actually in Nature Energy, uh, showing that very interesting behavior. For people who are working in electrochemistry, uh, field can recognize there is a capacitive envelope like a close to zero volt. This is actually in a acidic ultralight titanium 3 c 2 maxine film. But there is just very large peak, which is actually reversible. We call it electrochemical reversible because there is no difference in the potential between charging and discharging curve. So it behaves charges like a supercapacitor very, very quickly and at the same potential. But what you can notice here, we can go here to about 100 volt per second. Supercapacitor considered to be a very fast device being charged between like a 10 to 100 millivolts per second. Here we can go to 100,000 millivolts per second and a month ago we published paper showing we can go actually to 1,000 volt per second charges charge here. So basically charges within one millisecond entire device here. But it also get, for example, in this case, about 1,500 farad per cubic centimeter, which is an order of magnitude roughly more than carbon, activated carbon-based supercapacitor can give because of this redox wave. It combines redox storage and double air storage. This is a sulfuric acid electrolyte, like in a uh, lead acid battery here. It's not necessarily, but what this work showed was very, very fundamental and very, very important. It shows that we're not limited by redox reaction for high rate storage. So fundamentally, it is possible to have redox energy storage, like in a battery, but doing with extremely high rates. We just need right materials, correctly designed materials, things here. And actually, we can load uh, quite a, a significant layers of the materials here. And we can make transparent conducting films and actually, uh, this is a transparent uh, micro supercapacitor. And you can see from the bar on the right side, uh, it actually has significantly higher uh, capacitance per volume compared to, say, conducting polymers or graphene carbon nanotube films here. But 
when they align flakes parallel to the surface, we can make a thin device because ions have to move around flakes to get basically through the entire device. If we want to make a thick electrode, what we need to do, we need to make the flakes standing vertically here. And again, it's possible because in this paper, we actually used liquid crystal to align the flakes, but now we have shown that with the right flake size and concentration of maxine flake, suspension behaves, has liquid crystalline behavior, so we can align them vertically. And as a result, whether we have, for example, 40 micron or 200 micron uh, film, it gets pretty much the same capacity. So become not diffusion limited uh, in uh, direction normal to the uh, electrode surface here. So all this application open up when we learn how to control now designing structures with these two-dimensional flakes here. And there are, of course, many different challenges. For example, we have new material. We also need to think about new electrolytes because by default, electrolytes that are considered to be good may not necessarily be the best one. This is an example of work which is still under review in Nature Energy. Uh, but it shows that a certain night trial, which is considered to be like a standard supercapacitor electrolyte used with carbon materials and behaving very well, actually shows the worst performance when we use the maxine. And propylene carbonate, which is less conductive but order of magnitude lower conductivity, actually shows significantly better performance. And we know the mechanism because what we do always, we build all the application based on fundamental study. In case of propylene carbonate, there is a complete desalvation of ions. And lithium ions go between the layers of maxine with no solvent molecules. And it has two advantages. First, it's possible to pack more ions. But second, as you can see from in situ X-ray diffraction, there is no change in the lattice space. So there is no swelling, expansion, and contraction. The lattice parameter stays the same. When we have a DMSO, for example, there are a lot of solvent goes with DMSO in and there is constant fluctuations of the lattice parameter here. And with the Sydney trial, there are some molecules going in, lattice parameter changes a little bit, but capacitance also is much lower. So again, we need to learn. When we have new materials, we need to find how to fit them, how to design with them, how to find the right electrolyte for them here. And basically, there are, of course, many, many other applications for this material. We're still making first baby steps. All this, even like a good result I showed to you, they're still very first results. So there is plenty of room for improvement. There are new applications appearing very, very, very frequently for this material. This, of course, not just our work. This is work from many research groups, and this list is, of course, not complete. But people look into hydrogen storage, thermoelectrics, uh, lasers, uh, uh, femtosecond lasers, uh, uh, nonlinear optical devices, uh, water desalination purification. For example, Maxine, because it has very high negative charge on the surface, from minus 30 to minus 80 millivolts zeta potential. If it has large ions like uranium, chromium, lead, it can capture them from water, even in presence of other ions that were shown, even from seawater, when there are plenty of sodium around flowing it here. Gas separation membranes. Sensors, both gas sensors and biosensors. Uh, composite materials, electrocatalysis, HR, OAR, ORR. So there is a large range of application, again, based on composition properties of these materials, but as I mentioned here. Uh, there are like a, probably about uh, 500 research groups already published in Maxines, and there are uh, probably like uh, two, three papers a day now appearing in Maxines. And on a graphene, single material, more than 30 papers per day. And Maxine, the family, with 30 materials already produced, about 100 simple structures possible, and millions of compositions. So you can imagine how much more is to explore in that field here. And finally, uh, this is my research group. Uh, this was a Christmas party about a year ago in my house. A new one will appear. I see I'm holding a map of the world that my students gave me because we have people like from at that point for 13 different countries. I have one Indian student and one Indian postdoc in my group as well, and we collaborate with a lot of people around the world. You actually won't find Indian institutions here. It's not intentional, it just did not happen, uh, but I hope uh, this will happen in the future, and this is my actually very first visit to India. 
uh, but I'm confident not the last one uh, here. And before I f conclude, I wanted also to mention that we just started a new MS program in nanomaterials. So if anyone is interested uh, to continue uh, education, really work uh, and learn uh, from uh, uh, people in our department, uh, there is this new opportunity. Uh, particularly, we are looking for people who are interested to basically get nanotechnology knowledge on top of existing degrees in material science, physics, mechanical engineering, chemistry, and others, and go to apply nanotech in industry here. And of course, uh, uh, Professor Ajay uh, Kmarsud and myself are both uh, associate editors of ACS Nano. I know Professor Paul Weiss uh, was a speaker here a year ago, and this is a very good journal. We only publish full length papers. And we only publish about 14% of all manuscripts submitted to us. So it's very selective. But if you have done a good, thorough study, an in-depth study, and produced a full paper, please consider ACS Nano for your best work. For example, our discovery of this uh, layer, it's sand atomic sandwiches, Maxine's, was published in ACS Nano. And this is my really very last slide. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for staying uh, here late listening to me. If you are interested to learn more about of Maxine, probably the easiest reading is this review in Nature, uh, Nature Reviews materials uh, as a starting point published about two years ago almost already here. Uh, but if you want to look more into properties, this advanced materials review was published about two weeks ago. It has the most recent content uh, even so it focuses somewhat uh, more narrowly here. And you can even download our paper from my uh, website. Again, thank you very much for your attention. I'll be glad to answer questions. Thank you, Yuri, for this very fascinating talk. Uh, uh, I hope you'll take some questions. Uh, so, uh, uh, yes. Please be brief in questions uh, 16, so that we can 16,000 semen per centimeter. So what do you believe is the exact mechanism of uh, attaining a high conductivity for these materials? Well, again, uh, it, they're real metals. So it's uh, uh, like in carbide and nitride. Just for example, I'll give you an example. Titanium nitride in a bulk state is more conducting than titanium metal. Here, so those are free electrons. What we are still trying to understand is how electron hop between the layers, because I'm reporting data not for a single layer necessarily, but for multi-layer films here. So there is some tunneling, easy tunneling mechanism that allows this high conductivity. And this is what we are looking into right now. What could be the band gap of these materials? Band gap? It's a metal. Oh. Yeah, it is a metal. metal. Those are real metals, yeah. true metals with a okay. high density of states. Can we go to the, the next level. question? Yeah. Thank you, sir, for your talk. So are you also working on 2D synthesis of uh, three nitrates material? Mm -hmm. In the field of three nitrates, anything in three nitrates? Like you told, gallium nitrate can also be <coughs> synthesized. Uh, look, by this method, for example, there is no gallium precursor for gallium nitrate. But what you see, graphene just showed the path and showed two, many 2D materials are possible. People start to make materials that didn't exist here. We're actually now making carbides and nitrides two-dimensional also from 2D oxides by topochemical transformation of two-dimensional oxides into nitrides and carbides. So it means that it should be possible to make gallium nitride by this type of method in many, many other materials here. And also, I didn't talk about vapor phase deposition. Actually, the thinnest crystals that people produce now is still not a monolayer, like a two, three nanometer, like a 10 lattice parameters for moly carbide here. But variety of other methods of synthesis is possible. So I'm pretty sure it's possible to produce a very large number of materials in a two-dimensional stage and have stable 2D structures. Hello. Okay, Hello, one sir. second. Uh, yes. So no, you, can you sit down, please? No, no, you, you ask. Okay. So thank you for the wonderful talk. So I have just a few query of this new material. Number one is you talked about field effect transistor, but the band gap is zero. It's, it's almost semi-metal. So how do you consider it as a transistor? Number one. Number two, the basic problem of a 2D material is producing large area uh, flex. So 
I mean, what's the opportunity of that producing large area of heat with this material? Uh, look, again, uh, we, for example, don't work on semiconductor devices. You need a wider band gap, I guess, to make a really good transistor out of it. And maybe these materials will not be the ones that use in transistor, but there are many semiconducting two-dimensional material like dichalcogenides, which may be better for this drop here. So far, we can make single flakes up to about 20 microns because we produce them by wet chemical method in etching. It's still very large if you look at size of the flakes for other materials. For example, molydisulfide produced by wet chemical synthesis, you will hardly find more than one micron sized flake. High strength of maxin allows this, but for many electronic applications, you still want to be able to grow wafer size uh, monolayers. And this is again up to someone who works on CVD or PVD synthesis to develop this method. That's why it takes entire community to enable many other application of these materials or synthesis methods which have not been demonstrated yet. Sir, in uh, capacitor application, it will sir. give good. Yes. Where is this? Uh, oh, yeah. In capacitor application, will it give good cyclic stability like graphene? Uh, yes, it actually because gives a very good cycling stability. Uh, for aqueous systems that we look at, we'll get tens of thousands of cycles, uh, more than majority of pseudocapacitors here. We started to look more recently into uh, lithium ion capacitor, sodium ion capacitor applications. Uh, uh, fundamentally, you probably cannot get, at least we don't know how to get like uh, to millions of cycles uh, that we get in uh, uh, carbon capacitors, but we're talking about uh, like a 10 times larger energy density. At high rate, you can do it. For example, this supercapacitor I mentioned for ACDC conversion that we can uh, run basically at uh, 120 hertz frequency, we get to probably million cycles because they have been running like for a week and you can do the mass uh, uh, because, but this is again very, very short pulses. Uh, for this type of then One more question. Mm -hmm. What is the reason for high capacitance? Because the interface is entirely different. Can you tell about that interface? Yeah. How it will be composed? Again, most of this capacitance comes not from double air capacitance because specific surface area of this material is like a maximum uh, six, seven uh, hundred square meter per gram. So activated carbon or graphene perfectly exfoliated can give you two, three times of these values. So most of it comes from redox capacitance, pseudo capacitance, so known. Because we transfer electrons, we basically reduce or oxidize transition metal in the surface layer. It changes oxidation state, storing more energy. So this is where main uh, storage comes from. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll have a few more questions. I know a lot of uh, people, let's be very brief. Can you just? Uh, hello. Uh, yeah. Uh, After thank this, can you uh, thank you for. Uh, a very good talk and we are enlightened by your talk. Yes. So I want to know whether this material can be used for solar applications? Uh, you know, so far there have been uh, just uh, uh, two papers, I believe, on solar applications. Uh, one where people uh, try uh, to use it as a layer to stabilize uh, uh, perovskite solar cell. I know there is one paper under review by my colleagues uh, uh, where it actually uh, used to improve tin oxide uh, layer again in perovskite solar cells. And again, I know a couple of people looking as a conducting additive uh, uh, to disensicide solar cells here. So again, it can be used probably as an electron donor. It can be used as a transparent conducting layer rather than as a semiconductor generating uh, electrons or holes. Okay, okay, thank uh, you. Can you just, uh, okay. yeah. Uh, number one, uh, regarding nano medicine, uh, are you concentrating on a particular disease or ailment, like uh, extending it further, personalized medicine or precision medicine, mm -hmm. what's known as, that's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, can you throw some light on green nanotechnology? With respect uh, to environment or agriculture, right. whatever it is. Uh, two answers here. One is again, as you have seen this long list of collaborators we have, is because whenever we venture into some applications, we usually work with people who know more than me about it here. And I know very little, I know a little bit of material chemistry. But 
I am a newbie in antennas or drug delivery uh, or uh, brain electrodes. So what we do, we basically demonstrate properties. We talk to people how to apply it here. So application, for example, photothermal came from our us publishing uh, this plasma resonance. Then people look at titanium-3 C2, titanium-2 C are biocompatible and show no cytotoxicity, uh, no inflammatory response, and people started to explore them for other applications here. So we don't target specific diseases, and again, community focused on cancer research. We looked at the brain electrodes and uh, absorption of urea because we knew from our intercalation experiments that Maxine absorbed urea well. There are potentially probably other applications. People start looking at various type of uh, printable tattoos, biosensor. I saw papers on glucose sensors with Maxine, other things here. So regarding your second question, green application technology, one I mentioned actually appeared after Fukushima uh, plant in very early stage of Maxine research, removing, for example, toxic heavy metals, multivalent elements, uranium, chromium, lead, from seawater. This was one of the first applications. At the moment, materials are still relatively new. And while, for example, titanium carbide, there is nothing fundamentally expensive. There are very common element. When they make it lab scale, it's still not iron oxide particles, uh, not even graphene, and probably will never be as cheap as charcoal. So again, I think whenever you think about this application, you need to think where it makes sense, or where it makes sense to use it as a first step, with eventually scaling up, it can go further here. Membranes for water desalination, actually capacitive denization and reverse osmosis is another application a number of groups are uh, looking at. And again, gas separation, uh, which can actually be also very important for energy saving because instead of liquefaction of gases, if there is a good and they're extremely good separating membrane making here, it's possible to do separation of gases uh, at a much, much lower cost here. So those okay, are I think we'll uh, slowly come to a close. Uh, I would just request one or two more questions, then you can catch him at the dinner time. How it will be a useful for uh, environmental hostile disposals? Say hostile, again? Environmental hostile disposals will be using nanotechnology. Uh, look, can you throw some light? It will be grateful to you. There are a number of groups that are working uh, on catalysis now. Here again, I'm not an expert in catalysis. We're collaborating with some colleagues working on hydrogen evolution reaction. And it came actually from supercapacitor studies because we wanted to find materials with the widest voltage window. And it appeared that some of them actually have very low over potential uh, for evolution here. This also uh, addresses environmental question. If titanium carbide, for example, degrades, oxidizes under water, air, and uh, sunlight. It produces titanium particles and carbon dioxide. So there are no toxic residues. But again, when we're talking about vanadium or chromium uh, carbide or nitrides, uh, maxins, we again need to think, OK, are they toxic? Are they environmentally can be disposed this way? There are no answer to this, because many things simply have not yet been studied for these materials here. And this, I think, opens exciting opportunities for a large research community here to delve into this new family of materials uh, and explore their properties, application, environmental stability, environmental application. I think water purification will be one of uh, really major applications for these materials because they show extremely uh, good uh, performance. And I know this is an important task in India here. Uh, Yuri, I'm sure you will go whole night <laughs> if we do not apply constraints, which I hate to do. Mm -hmm. If you are a game, we can go for the whole night. <laughs> or uh, I request that we close the session now mm -hmm. and take over the discussion to the dinner uh, yes, time. And uh, Professor Yuri has traveled a long way. I don't know how he is so active, even with his jet lag. He just arrived today. So uh, you will all agree that it has been a really fascinating lecture, an extremely good start to Bangalore Nano. And please thank me in thanking you. So with this, uh, let me hand over the mic. Thank you very much.
Professor. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I would request Professor Su to kindly give a, a memento in the form of a book to our esteemed speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for taking time off uh, and coming to Bengaluru. <laughs>